I don't want to play with you anymore. So, the time has come. We must now all acknowledge that digital cameras exist. So let's talk about this, the Nikon F6, the most digital, but the most advanced film SLR ever made. Released in 2004, the Nikon F is the last Nikon F film camera to be designed and built by Nikon. And it truly is the Plantagenet to the throne of the F cameras. But even more recently, Nikon discontinued the F6 in 2020, making it the last 35 mm SLR in production. However, some rumors are around that Nikon was actually discontinuing the camera's manufacturing quite a bit before 2020, and they were simply selling off all the old stock that they made and built up over time. Because let's be honest, the amount of people buying brand new F6s is actually fairly slim. Now, when it comes to using the F6, it is basically the most digital film camera ever made. And coming from someone who's been shooting Nikon DSLRs for a few years now, I was able to pick this up and it just felt exactly in the hand as you'd expect it to. All of the buttons are in the same place, all of the controls are in the right places, albeit there are fewer controls because you know there's fewer things that this camera can do compared to a digital camera, but everything just feels right and it feels like a true Nikon camera. You really can see how this is an ancestor to the digital cameras, albeit probably the true ancestor would be the F5 and before that the F4 where Nikon really did start this sort of design language for their cameras. In the F4 it was a little crude looking but you could see the beginnings. The F5 solidified it and the F6 perfected it. If we look at the F6 compared to the latest DSLR released by Nikon, the D780, you can see that the design language really hasn't changed all that much between the two versions of the cameras even though these were released about 18 years apart. The only issue is that the F6 is actually a lot heavier and a lot sturdier in this camera and my left arm is actually getting kind of tired so I'm going to put these down. So to use this camera it's basically the same as shooting on pretty much any Nikon DSLR. We've got our power switch here right around our shutter button like every other Nikon camera. You just flick it on and if you flick it past the on position you get a backlight on your top LCD and rear LCD. You can also just turn it off with another flick. Next to that we've got our mode button. So hold that down and you can rotate your command dial and that will switch you through the manual auto aperture priority, shutter priority and program exposure modes. Next to it we've got our exposure compensation button. So you just press that down, rotate the dial, same deal. Uh, one issue is that in typical Nikon fashion, they are backwards. So to increase exposure compensation, you rotate the dial to the left. This is basically the way it's been on Nikon cameras for a very long time. Although the new uh, digital cameras do allow you to change the direction of that meter, which is very handy because having plus on the left is a bit unintuitive. Moving on to the back of the camera, we've got our AF on switch, which, you know, is the back button focus which you should be using anyone who doesn't use it needs to have their head checked next to it we've got our auto exposure lock and af lock button for you know focus and recompose and then down on the back here we have something a little unusual for a film camera which is different autofocus modes so there's a single point autofocus this is like a group autofocus where you select kind of group of them and it picks the focus point that has the subject closest to it uh, then you've got you know range autofocus and just use the whole grid and the camera will pick the correct point even though it doesn't so I just leave this on single point autofocus 90% of the time. Under this little flap here we've got a few selector buttons so we've got our ISO button and you can just hold that down and turn the command dial to pick your ISO or you can set the ISO to DX and it will automatically read the film canister and pick whatever ISO is on the canister. I don't use that, I fuck about with the ISO, so I use the ISO selection manually. Next to that we've got our flash for turning on flash. And the last two buttons here are unusual for a film camera because we have an info button, which shows information about your film. But the other button is a menu button. And that is because the F6 actually has a menu system. 
and you navigate it using this little D-pad right here, which also has a lock on it. This is also used to select your focus point. So if we go into our menus, we actually have the ability to set up custom setup. You can set up autofocus, you know, back button focusing, metering settings, uh, controls, custom controls. You can change the direction of the dials and stuff to match other camera manufacturers that don't have the dials weirdly set up. Um, and you've just got all kinds of cool settings in here, which is really unusual to have on a film camera. But if you're using this film camera as a sort of automatic kind of just film shooting machine, you're not manually doing everything, having these custom settings is actually really, really handy. As for all the options that are in the menus, go look up the manual. I'm not going to go through them all here. Up here, we've got our, obviously got our eyepiece with our little shutter to close the eyepiece for ultra long exposures. And then we have one of the kind of disappointments of the F6 is that the prism is not user removable. And that is because this is the only F camera out of the F, F2, 3, 4, and 5, and 6 with a non-removable prism. I don't know why that is. I'm assuming it was for cost. Up here on the top, you've got your metering modes with spot metering and center-weighted metering, which is your classic, you know, center-weighted film camera metering mode. And with the F6, you can actually change the balance of how the center-weighted metering works in the menus, as well as the size of the spot for spot metering. But then in the middle, we've got the best metering mode, 3D color matrix. Now, if your trousers are getting uncomfortably tight thinking about that 3D color matrix metering I just mentioned, well, you're not alone. And essentially it is Nikon's evaluative metering method. And I have to say, you know, after using the F100 for a couple of years, which has a similar metering system, although not as advanced as the F6 is, I can happily say that with the F6, the meter is basically infallible. You know, only in the most extreme lighting situations will this camera not be able to meter. I have put this up against some ridiculous lighting situations and every single picture came out absolutely perfectly exposed for a neutral balance of colors. Obviously it can't meter, you know, for a silhouette shot because that's not what the meters are targeting. The meter is targeting the most balanced exposure. So if you want the most balanced exposure, the meter on this is basically infallible. And I happily rely on it for all of the shooting I do on this camera. It's basically glued to that mode. On the left here, we've got our shooting modes. So we've got single, continuous low, continuous high, continuous silent, timer, and a mirror up mode, which is very useful for longer exposures combined with the IP shutter. Down here, we've got our bracketing button. So you can actually set this camera up to do bracketing and it can do like seven shot, five shot, three shot bracketing which is actually quite useful for certain film stocks or if you just want to guarantee that you get a particular shot and are not too concerned about burning huge piles of cash given the film prices these days. And then coming around to the front of the camera, we have our PC socket cover. And then underneath that, you've got the 10 pin Nikon connector. And this is for remotes and you can actually get metadata out of the camera using this port. I really like the way that these aren't the unscrewed and instantly lose the kind of covers as well. And then down here you've got your focusing selector. So you've got continuous autofocus, single autofocus and manual. And lastly, on the bottom of this camera, we have a function button, which is quite unusual for a film camera. And there's actually a couple of options you can do with this. I have mine set to spot metering. So if I hold this down, the camera auto switches to spot metering. So I can just quickly check the exposure of a particular point that I know I want to be, you know, plus one, plus two or whatever, or minus one on my meter. So press that in and I can just quickly check it. Very handy thing to have. As for the lens compatibility in the F6, it's basically compatible with every single Nikon F lens mount with two caveats. One, if the camera doesn't have the AI tab modification, then you cannot mount pre-AI lenses. And what I'm referring to there is that on Nikon cameras, there is the AI tab here, which couples two lenses with an aperture ring with the AI notch in it. Now on some F6s, and Nikon used to offer service to convert the F6s, but they don't anymore. This aperture coupling ring can actually be interchanged for one where you can fold the tab out of the way and use pre-AI lenses. Unfortunately, that's not an option anymore. So I'm stuck with one with the AI tab on it anyway. 
and the other lens compatibility issue on this camera is way down the other end of the scale with some of the ultra modern E lenses. And that is because the E lenses with their electronically controlled diaphragms, the F6 can't actually control the diaphragm. So the lens will stay permanently locked open at its maximum aperture. So if you have the 105mm f1.4 lens, for example, the aperture will stay locked open at 1.4 because this camera doesn't know how to stop that lens down. But apart from those issues, every other Nikon lens works 100%. All of the AI lenses, AIS lenses, AF lenses with the autofocus more built into the camera body. It also works with all of the G lenses with AFS motors as well. So to load the camera, we just lift up the rewind knob, back doors open, drop in a roll of film, like so. Stretch it out to the tab, close, and we are ready to go. And then all you need to do is set the camera to continuous high and blast through an entire roll. When it comes to rewinding the film in this camera, you have two options. The first thing you always do is you release the film rewind with this little button under a flap until it clicks. And then you can either manually crank the film backwards using the rewind crank. And this is actually a really nice feature. So if your camera gets caught with no batteries, you can still rewind it. Or you can just press the rewind button up here and it spins it back into place for you automatically. And with that, we can just open up the back and extract our beautifully shot test roll of film. Boom. Now, when it comes to FPS, this camera can achieve five FPS like this, but if you get the battery grip, you can get it up to eight FPS. Although I think five FPS is fast enough because otherwise you're going to be emptying your bank account into this camera very quickly. As for other cool tricks this camera has up its sleeve, one of the most interesting Something I really want to try out is the fact that this camera has an inbuilt intervalometer. So you can actually go into the interval timer setting and then you can tell it to take, you know, five shots every, you know, 10 seconds for X amount of time, which is actually quite useful if you want to do like a time lapse or you want to shoot a scene and leave the camera running autonomously for a while. Having an interval timer is quite a nice little function. One last cool thing this camera can do is if we take a look at the pressure plate on the film door, we can see that there are two data imprinting windows. So this one here imprints on the frame and this one here actually can imprint data between the frames of the film. So you can actually have this print your ISO, your shutter speed, whether you use flash or not, the date and time, all that good information in between the frames. So you get all of the metadata wrote into the actual film without having it imprinted directly on the pictures, which is actually really cool. Now, I actually do believe that with the right data back, this is also available on the F5, but the F6 has it built in by default. So to test out the F6, I've shot a couple of rolls through it in my local area, and I also brought it to Waterford on a short day trip.
if you're going out to buy an F6, there are two things you do need to be aware of before you purchase one. The first is the fact that the older F6s, generally ones with serial number under 18,000, have to have a firmware update done to them at some point in the future. Now this may not be necessary, but it's probably a good idea to get it done. Unfortunately, the only place that does it is Nikon Japan, so you'll have to send your camera to Tokyo to get the firmware updated. It's not something the user can actually do. The second issue is the fact that inside these cameras there is a little small rechargeable internal battery. And this battery is responsible for maintaining the camera's clock. That way the date and time stay constant. But if you leave this camera for a really, really long time, the batteries in here can actually die. And when that happens, the camera will switch back to the internal battery to keep the clock running. But if that internal battery runs completely flat and stays flat for too long, it actually dies. And with that, the camera can't maintain the date and time every time you take out the battery and you have to reset it. And once again, this is something only Nikon Japan can fix. Now, this particular camera has both of those issues. It has a serial number of about 9,000 and it has the dead internal battery issue. So I'm actually going to be sending this to Japan fairly soon to have it serviced, get it CLA'd, get the battery fixed and just get the camera spruced up so it'll last for a really long time into the future. So to wrap up my thoughts on the F6, it is basically the perfect of this style of camera, if that makes any sense, you know. If you want a high-tech SLR camera that's pretty much automatic, this is as good as it gets. Obviously it's not the best point and shoot camera because, well, it's not a point and shoot and it's not the best rangefinder because, well, it's an SLR, it's not a rangefinder and it's not the best, you know, SLR windy camera because it doesn't have a winder. You know, it's fully electronic and in its class, it is the best. Now, when it comes to buying an F6, they are getting pretty expensive. I found this for about half the price that they normally sell for online, so I got a great deal on it. I also sold my Nikon F100 to help pay for it. But if you're willing to pay full price for one of these, I'm not 100% sure it really is worth owning. And it's a weird thing to say, it is a spectacular camera and for the price I got it for, it is absolutely worth the money. But given the fact that the F100 exists and if you can stomach its weight, the F5 also exists and it has the vast majority of the features that this camera has, I would actually recommend picking up an F100 and F5 over this if you want something that is 90% of this but considerably cheaper. However, because I'm a Nikon fanboy, I bought an F6 because I want one. And that's it. Hope you enjoyed the video. See you next time.